we're going to talk about early U.S. clinical experience. We were fortunate to be uh, the first center to, uh, to use FREDx, so we uh, actually have six-month follow-up in geography in a few of our patients. Uh, these are my disclosures, uh, of which uh, I want to mention I'm the national PI for uh, the FREDx uh, upcoming trial. Um, so these are the current uh, uh, FDA flow diverters approved, uh, FRED, uh, in December of 2019. We all know the results of the SAFE trial, low mortality, low morbid morbidity in one year. And there were a lot of other registries. This is the large registry from I Italy with uh, similar low morbidity and mortality that led to the FDA approval of FRED in 2019. Um, this actually is hot of the press. This is the Pennsylvania post-market FRED multi-center trial uh, in the state of Pennsylvania. And uh, these are the results. You see uh, complete and near complete occlusion, really high numbers. Uh, over 90% uh, percent and uh, less than 3% uh, uh, of patients required retreatment. Um, here's a six-month uh, MRS 0 to 2, 98 percent, and ischemic complications less than 3 percent. So uh, you saw the uh, indications, FRED to FREDx, same indications from the Petrus uh, ICA all the way to the carotid terminus, uh, average metal surface area around 30 percent. Um, this, uh, one of the best parts of FRED-X and the FRED device in general is the lack of flow diversion segment in the distal portion of the stent. Uh, triaxial support always recommended, especially in the beginning of your first 10 cases. So we had a lot of experience with FRED. Um, these are some of our, um, uh, some of our cases that we did for, uh, for the SAFE trial. Uh, really uh, a very nice result. We all know that immediate venous stase is carrying on into the late venous stase. Uh, is the number one prognostic indicator for a 100% six-month follow-up and geography occlusion. Uh, so FREDx, um, uh, this is a great review of surface modification in general. Uh, from FRED to FREDx, the, the changes are uh, basically the company aligned uh, FRED Junior stand, which is FRED 21, um, and added the four proximal connections between the two layers. Uh, and uh, the con these connections continue throughout the stent. And then, of course, the PMEA surface modification uh, technology, uh, which, uh, as you see here, uh, behaved in, uh, in vitro superior to all the other surface modifiers. So we were the first site uh, to do FRED-X, and uh, we have nearly 20 cases thus far. Um, this is our series. Uh, the most common location is uh, the ophthalmic segment, uh, PCOM cavernous, and then um, other, I promise, I'm not going to talk off-label, uh, but some really cool off-label cases. <laughs> uh, so the results, feasibility, ability to deploy the stent 100% of the time, similar to what you heard earlier. Uh, this is uh, uh, very reproducible, very easy to, uh, uh, to teach and to deploy device, single device in all cases adjunct coiling in uh, uh, a one case, and again, typically in all the data recommended intradural aneurysms that are a centimeter or greater uh, to prevent rupture, 0% uh, mortality in our series. Uh, and just recently, uh, one transient morbidity at TIA uh, in one of the FREDs, the patient is now neurologically intact. However, we did add anticoagulation in addition to her antiplatelet therapy because she developed a uh, transient thrombus within her stent. Um, so uh, these are some of the cases. This is a patient that had a ruptured left PCOM aneurysm, underwent uh, microsurgical clipping. As Adam mentioned, we're also uh, a dual training program. We do uh, a lot of aneurysm clips. Um, um, and uh, the patient had a contralateral superior hypophyseal artery aneurysm uh, that was treated with a FREDx. And this is, was actually one of the first cases we did. And I have a six-month follow-up angiogram here to your uh, right. That showed 100 percent aneurysm occlusion. You can see here also her contralateral clip. Um, this is our antiplatelet protocol. Uh, we use aspirin uh, and uh, clopidogrel for about 10 days. Uh, very strictly check P2Y12 and uh, favorable being between 30 and 90 percent inhibited. Anything that less than 30 percent, um, uh, we actually load with uh, ticagrelor. So as you heard earlier, uh, the distal tines open immediately and steadily so you don't have to drag the stent. You literally position it exactly where you need it. And uh, I, I do love this uh, to treat very distal paraclinoid aneurysms, especially in the anterior choroidal region. Oftentimes, with previous flow diverting stents, you have to jail the A1 to make sure that you really cover the distal neck well. In this case, you can just land the non flow diverting segment in the carotid bifurcation, even more distal than the case that John showed earlier, 
uh, with really no consequences in jailing the A1. Sizing, this is uh, one thing that I learned from my original FRED cases and moving on to FREDx. And uh, I know uh, uh, talking to Microvention, this is the current recommendation as well. Uh, uh, you always, you need to upsize more than you're used to. So uh, typically at least a half a millimeter upsize. So I'll give you some examples in a 4.1 mil millimeter vessel, uh, 4.5 uh, was the, the stunt of choice. This is a case of, uh, a web case of ruptured basilar apex aneurysm, uh, who also had a ratophthalmic artery aneurysm treatment and uh, presented with this shallow wide neck recurrence. You can see here the sizing of the vessel, distal carotid was 2.84, uh, proximal was 3.57. So I use, again, w always uh, err on the size of upsizing if you're between two sizes. This was a four uh, by uh, 18 to 12. One thing I really want to, uh, especially if these are your first FRED cases, FRED X, is to be very mindful of the helices. Uh, it's very easy to, uh, you know, decipher a pipeline stent or some of those conventional tubular stents, but you really have to be very careful with the helix. Make sure that you don't stretch the helix because you can deploy uh, with uh, significant instant stenosis up front. It's a different way of visualizing our stents, and we're not used to it. So in the very beginning, really take your time and uh, watch your stent deploy. This is another example uh, of the previous case. Um, uh, the, this lady actually had a mere contralateral left ophthalmic artery aneurysm. So um, not only Fred X is safe, but it's safe to do bilateral. Uh, so in this case, it was a 3.6 millimeter carotid, and I placed a 4 by 23 by 17 millimeter stent. Uh, similar to the, uh, the distal part of the stent always opening, uh, the proximal part of the stent, if you're within the proximal most 25 to 30 percent, don't wag the tail, don't, don't do any of those maneuvers, just give stent out. It will never not open. Um, it just has a really nice proximal and distal uh, radial force and I've never seen it not open. So, um, and, and this patient, she has two webs and two fret X's, so I guess this is a microvention dream of a case. Uh, <laughs> she's doing well and I look forward to her six month follow up. Um, this is another patient in ophthalmic artery aneurysm, medially projecting, again sizing. You see here I'm at 4.41 millimeters and I upsize to a 5 millimeter stent. So always upsize. It also decreases the risk of thrombogenic complications. Um, and again, the last part of the device as you see here, just give the stent out. Don't even worry about it. It will always deploy. Uh, this is a patient very safely uh, treating ruptured cases, 75-year-old uh, um, with a has grade 3 subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, he had a, a blister of thalmic artery aneurysm on the left. Um, uh, this was treated with flow diversion. We only needed 12. You, you'll see the more you do these devices, similar to what John presented, the shorter your stents will be. So this is a 12 millimeter total coverage, and uh, we did a 5, uh, 15 to 8 millimeter stent. Uh, one thing I want to uh, really make sure you're, you're careful with is the measuring of the vessel. Uh, I know when I train, typically we use conventional biplane angiography, but uh, the three-dimensional reconstruction is far more accurate. So in this case, um, the actual uh, biplane told me that it's a 3.5 millimeter vessel. However, on the 3D it was 4.5 in maximal diameter. So I ended up using a 5 millimeter stent. Our protocol for ruptured aneurysms, uh, we always uh, uh, bolus with, with heparin as the microcatheter is going up. And uh, in my institution, we have terofaban. I know um, there's other IV antiplatelets uh, used all across the country. And these patients, we do not even take a chance with Plavix. They all get loaded with ticagrelol, and they stay on uh, 9 dBID thereafter. Um, uh, this is uh, obviously here, this is a blister aneurysm. You're not going to see any venous stasis within the stent, and this is the native shot. Uh, one thing that I really like about FredX is uh, a lot of these stents are resheathable, but this really has such good, um, it's such a sturdy stent that you can resheath up to three times. A lot of us are working in teaching institutions. We have fellows and residents that we train. I find this far more easier, uh, and I have uh, less palpitations during and at the end of the case, walking a fellow through it. So uh, it's really a great teaching tool uh, with flow diversion. Um, this is uh, another recent case, uh, a 56-year-old male with uh, headaches and strong family history of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, this is the uh, paraclinar aneurysm, the 3D high uh, magnification. 
again, uh, these are some of the measurements. Um, the headway, um, I think, um, it, obviously it's unlike the 21, but it, it does a, a pretty good job navigating some uh, tortuosities such as uh, here on this distal hypophyseal. And again, be very careful watching the helices develop and not stretching the helices. Um, uh, similar to John, I've never had to do a balloon angioplasty within a deployed Fred X. So uh, if you size it properly, uh, that's really not an issue. Um, uh, this is uh, my last case. This is an ophthalmic artery uh, uh, superior immediately projecting aneurysm in a 56-year-old female. You can see here a very steady uh, stent deployment. You don't have to uh, uh, drag it into the lenticular striates in the MCA. Uh, it's very accurate. Uh, you do have to watch uh, for shortening, especially in the proximal most part. It's not as significant as other flow diverting uh, stents. So one of my advice is because you don't really have to worry about forming it and shaping it, 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 it kind of develops itself. Um, when you first start, go a little bit longer before you start becoming super precise. We just don't want to miss the aneurysm, especially, and it always happens at the proximal most part of your neck because you're so judicious and careful distally, you tend to not um, uh, you know, estimate some foreshortening that happens in all stents. Um, this is the final angiogram here. And uh, we have six month follow-up angiography uh, in this patient as well, which is nice. They're all coming in and uh, they're looking fantastic. This is a six month follow-up angiogram. No instant stenosis, 100% aneurysm occlusion. So uh, similar to what Adam uh, presented earlier, uh, this is a team sport. We get a lot of our data from our European colleagues, and uh, uh, here we co-presented uh, with, uh, with one of our colleagues from Europe, and uh, look forward to uh, signing up a lot of sites in the U.S. for FredX.